so formal now. Yes. <laughs> oh, I see so, it must have been a problem with people saying, but you didn't tell me it was being recorded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's not an issue here. Um, thanks to everybody for being here tonight. Um, looks like we have at least one new face. So why don't we quickly go around and introduce ourselves and um, uh, maybe just say where in the town you're from generally, or if you have a, a specific role with the town. My name is David West. I'm the town planner um, and I have been for about six months now. Um, and but actually before we go around, I just wanna make sure everybody knows that these meetings are open to anyone. All you have to do to participate is show up um, oh, yeah. A little bit of echo there. Yeah. I'm going to mute Catherine. And we'll just go around uh, one at a time. And we start with Joel. Okay. Um, I'm the chair of the planning group, of which this is a subgroup. Uh, also the town supervisor. And I live in the middle of West Danby. Thanks, Joel. How about John Jensen? Uh, John Jensen, uh, Steam Mill Road, 10 year resident. Thanks, John. Olivia? Um, live at eight, uh, 194 East Miller Road, yeah, and own the properties at 1839, 1849 Dandy Road in the Hamlet. Is that a, I see Alyssa? this in the background. Hi, there. yeah, I, I'm over in Willoughbyville, <laughs> lifelong resident for right now, but at the for right now at Olivia's. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. I see Sarah's driving. Sarah Schnabel is town board member. Um, how about Rhonda? Uh, Rhonda Roaring, South Danby Road. And Pat? Oh, you're muted. Pat you go. Woodworth, Gunderman Road. Sorry. Thanks, Pat. Um, how about uh, Catherine and then Ted and then Debbie? Hi, I'm Catherine Hunter, West King Road. Ted? I'm Ted Crane. I live in the center of Danby, which is, of course, in the center of the universe. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. And how about Debbie? Uh, Debbie Benson, 50 Ball Hill Road, um, resident of Danby for 20 years. Great. Thanks for joining us, Debbie. It's nice to see you. Um, so tonight we're going to pick up um, where we left off at our last Hamlet meeting. Uh, one of the things that we were discussing is um, the, the draft zoning proposal. We were going through the comments that people had. And one of the things that a few people disagreed with, so I thought we'd talk about tonight, um, was drive-throughs. So in the draft zoning proposal, uh, drive-throughs were not allowed in the Hamlet. Um, the reasoning behind that is that they add uh, curb cuts that make it difficult to create a really pedestrian friendly environment um, and they, they really don't uh, contribute to that kind of Hamlet Center village center feel but we had I think significant number of people who said some of the businesses we really want need this to succeed and so I agreed to put together a little presentation about ideas of how you can incorporate drive-throughs in a way that is less damaging. So I'm going to share that screen. And the presentation. So um, what we're going to look at is examples of how drive-throughs can be made less damaging to a Hamlet context. Things that we, if we wanted to allow drive-throughs, we would want to consider incorporating. Um, so first to understand, sorry, I think my pictures are probably blocking your view. Um, can you see the whole slide now? I think so. Okay. Um, yep. So first, just an example of what's really the worst way to have a drive-through incorporated in some place that you want to be friendly to human beings, safe to walk, comfortable to be, a place that people are going to want to be. Um, and this example is actually near my house. It's Dunkin' Donuts in the city of Ithaca mm -hmm. at Meadow and Green Street. Um, so it basically, we're going to look at other examples that are better, but this is kind of the starting condition. This is what most of the chains want to be able to do. They want a moat of roads all the way around the building. Um, the building with their kind of standard 
corporate architecture that's usually very cheap um, materials that don't hold up well and don't transfer to another use well. Um, the entire site is dominated by cars, makes it really inhospitable to walk near it um, or to it or from it. It's a single use building. It's not gonna be something else that'll probably be torn down if this business closes. Um, and it creates missing teeth in the urban fabric. So holes along the street front. Um, so this is kind of our worst case scenario, what we really shouldn't wanna see in the Hamlet. So this is one step better. Um, this is a McDonald's in Saratoga Springs where they have strong um, design guidelines and architectural standards. Um, so it has a little bit more pleasant architecture. It has nice materials, the brick. Um, it faces the street. It has a front door that you can walk to from the sidewalk. The building doesn't have parking or a drive aisle between it and the sidewalk. So those are the things that make it better. The things that are still bad about it, it's a completely car dominated site. The building is you know, less than probably 20% of the site. It's almost all parking and car circulation. It's still really a single use building. If this use wasn't there anymore, it would probably be torn down. Has multiple curb cuts from different angles. Um, you know, at least it does have that little green patch connecting to the sidewalk, but uh, for the most part, it's a car dominated site. Um, and that creates a missing teeth in the urban fabric that really in most contexts, somebody who is walking on a main street, if they came to this, that would be the end of the walk. You're suggesting McDonald's is a destination? <laughs> there are lots of people, yeah. Um, so this is kind of the next step up also in Saratoga Springs. This is a subway um, that has uh, reasonable quality, at least on the ground floor materials that are durable and can hold up to pedestrians. Um, it has some architectural interests, not necessarily my favorite. It's not going to win any awards, but it's, um, it has some. It is more of a people dominated site. The building really is oriented to the sidewalk truly and includes a, a variety of things like outdoor tables and um, protection for the entrance. Um, who, a, owns that, who owns that building? I don't know. I um, mean, my question is, is Subway the owner of the building or are they just a renter? They're probably a renter. I doubt that they own it. Um, it's a mixed use building. So I don't know if it's apartments or um, office upstairs, but it has a mix of a barber shop and a subway and then the upstairs space, which is a more efficient use of the land. Um, it mm -hmm. doesn't create big missing teeth in the, the street front. This is actually an area, the previously suburban area that's infilling. So you can see down below what was there before um, which was a building set far back from the street. It was actually a good ice cream shop. I've had ice cream there many times, um, but it was really not doing anything for the street front. Uh, it was a very inhospitable place to walk. Um, actually next door is a Midas that I use as a good example of a Midas because it fronts the street. So they're filling in there and kind of trying to get better urbanism on this street in this part of uh, kind of a, a suburban arterial or highway outside of the city part of Saratoga Springs. Um, so the ice cream stop show behind it? No, nope. Um, they went out of business and were replaced by this mm -hmm. building that um, I think provides a lot more. Um, and you can see it actually creates a corner. The street uh, on the side goes back to a, a manufactured home park uh, behind there that's low cost housing. but. Mm -hmm. It was really kind of a forgotten about part of town that you go past on the way into town and they're really making this block more of a place. Um, it does have multiple curb cuts, um, but I think that's mitigated by the fact that it's on a corner. So one curb cut is on one street and the other is on the, the other street. Um, then getting to really the best case scenario is Gimme Coffee in Trumansburg. Um, it's solid architecture, really durable materials, 
it faces and addresses the street, it doesn't have any curb cuts, the parking is at the curb, um, it has a complete street wall, it's a mixed use building. Where's the drive through? There isn't a drive through. That's, that's kind of the But aren't these all examples of drive throughs? No. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like the fact, I mean, I've been here before, and I don't like the fact that uh, there are no trees or anything. There's no vegetation. It looks rather unfriendly and uh, hot and dry. Uh, there's, there are no tables for people to come out and eat. I think that the other, the previous picture was, was better, but I'm not saying it was great. That's fine. Um, another thing to consider is that um, this is a bank in uh, Cortland. Um, when you have a shared parking with other businesses that's behind, um, if you locate a drive-through or in this case, a drive-up teller in that location, it's really not impacting the street. It doesn't have to have the multiple curb cuts, you know, especially with parking shared between multiple businesses. Um, you're having much lower impact. So that's one other way, lower impact way to deal with it. Where's, the, then, where's the drive in here? So it's what's highlighted here. So this is the drive up, three drive up tellers. And this is Main Street and the building fronts on Main Street. And then off a of side street, you get into the kind of shared parking. It's a public parking area behind the buildings that are on the street. Mm -hmm. So you really have one curb cut here and one at the end of the block for you know, dozens of businesses, which is a really preferred way of dealing with uh, parking and with drive throughs And then finally, I thought that we might want to consider um, if we were going to allow drive throughs uh, because we really want some particular kinds of businesses in the interim and we think it would be too hard for them to exist without a drive through we could consider it in a way that only allows it for interim or successional development. So if someone wanted to open uh, a little coffee shop and we set limits of you know, uh, a very small size for a kind of temporary type building or trailer that um, would need drive-through to be able to be successful, that might be a way to get some life started um, in the Hamlet without opening the doors to the kind of drive-throughs that we don't wanna see. That would be long-term and really dominate um, the space and use up a lot of space in the area that we have for the Hamlet Center. So, so is this a drive-through in front of the building? Um, it's actually behind the building. Is it? Um, this is really common um, in the West where I'm from. It kind of pops up in suburban strip malls that have died um, using up you know, old parking space, you get a little coffee shop um, that starts out just as, you know, maybe a temporary trailer that you can come to and then they start setting up seating outside and then eventually they are successful enough that they can move into a real building. Uh, why don't we look into adopting some architectural um, architectural uh, rules like they have in Pittsburgh? Well, we do have commercial. Some, yeah, we do have some commercial design guidelines that do include architectural rules. Um, what's really at, at uh, issue here is the siting, the site design for mm -hmm. drive-throughs and um, you know, the architecture well, is when Pittsburgh, when McDonald's wanted to put up a, pit, a McDonald's in the village of Pittsburgh, right there in the, on the main drag, they were required, this was back in the 1980s, they were required to meet the design rules. And it was the first time McDonald's had ever acquiesced to something like that. They weren't even allowed to put up their golden arches. And they had to maintain the brick facade and the whole business and they did it. 
And I don't see why we couldn't require something like that. So we don't get all of this eclecticness that looks kind of piggledy piggledy. Well, you may recall that Ithaca did the same thing when McDonald's was on the commons. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. It indeed. Um, earlier, you mentioned by way of introduction that there were some businesses that required drive throughs that, uh, did you say they were desirable? Could you tell us what they are? I, I think the ones that people have mentioned are a cafe um, or a, a restaurant or a bank. Those are all things that people have mentioned. Um, or a, I think a pharmacy was also something that was discussed. Mm -hmm. um, both a bank and a pharmacy, you know, frequently have their drive-through kind of more behind and we could require that. Um, it's less common with a kind of restaurant or cafe for that to be the case. And I think that's why I would wanna make sure we had some strong requirements in place for something better than you would typically get um, or we will get the worst. Uh, a question about distance from the curb. Yeah. Uh, and maybe this has been covered, so stop me if this has already gone over. Um, comparing like the, um, the McDonald's in Saratoga versus the uh, Trumansburg, uh, are we encouraging uh, sidewalks that start right at the curb and go up to the building? Or would there be an allowable yeah, setback? Line. What's that? A tree yeah. lawn? Or, or would we want like a tree lawn and allow buildings to be further back if they're gonna create like cafe, uh, cafe tables out in front, that sort of thing. Is, is that all possible within the frame we're talking now? I think it's all possible within what we've defined. We need to have some flexibility because we don't have sidewalks yet. So figuring out how and where some kind of pedestrian circulation could happen. Um, I think it requires flexibility and not really putting the buildings. We don't have a line to put them to line them all up on at this point. Um, I don't see why we're discussing this because we're never going to have a McDonald's. Uh, they will require uh, piped in water and they have, you know, need a huge number of people coming. We're never going to be able to supply that. And so I don't even understand why we're bothering to discuss something like this. Not for McDonald's sake, but for the sake of entertaining any drive-ins drive at all. Right, we, we know that there are, there is a likelihood of getting businesses like this, whether it was a dandy mart with a drive-through for a Dunkin' Donuts um, or uh, another fast food joint, there's, there's certainly the possibility if we allow it that we can get it. Um, and it was my understanding that that's not really what people are looking for in the Hamlet. Um, but in our last discussion, there, there was some people who said, we would wanna consider this. Um, there was also, you know, some people who said, hey, you know, we can, they can have their off street parking and if they wanna offer, you know, pull up service where they'll bring something out to your car, that's fine, but we don't, maybe we don't want them to have drive throughs um, So what I, what I said I would do is bring the, the ways that you can reduce the impacts of a drive through and we can discuss if, if we're comfortable with that, if that is ad an adequate reduction in impact, um, or if, if we wanna not allow drive throughs in the Hamlet Center. And, uh, David, do you need to do you need to restrict it all together? I mean, in that um, survey that you sent around, and I started work on that. You have, you know, levels of review. So maybe something like the drive-through would require more scrutiny, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to medium scrutiny or staff review or permitted anywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's something that I would be comfortable with if somebody wants to have some kind of a situation with drive through, whether it's for ice cream or something else that, you know, we just planning board looks at it and, and, you know, maybe then there's more environmental review or more neighbor input or whatever. I mean, I think that's something I'd be comfortable with. 
Um, I saw that John had his hand up. Yeah, thanks. Can you elaborate again? I know you, you mentioned this at the last meeting, but elaborate on and suggest where we go if we want to read more, but elaborate on the effects on draining, this was your term, draining uh, demand for the, for the more interesting small businesses that we'd want, let's say at Olivia's site. If, if you, you seem to be saying it depended partly on the kind of drive through and on how far away from the, the main drag it was. And it wasn't just the drive through idea, you were talking about essentially a national chain or a large scale chain. So the draining, it's the draining of demand that I'm interested in. Yeah, um, may, maybe I can share uh, afterwards by email some, some resources on that. But I, the discussion that we were having there is people were concerned that there is a limited area here that we're talking about for business. And we, we really want to fill in what we're designating as the Hamlet core. Um, but there was concern that we should also allow more businesses elsewhere in the town, particularly along 96B. And that, you know, maybe if it wasn't in the core of the Hamlet, we wouldn't care so much if it was walkable. And maybe, you know, we let something like a dandy mart that's a gas station and corner store and cafe and car wash and you know <laughs> shoe repair whatever <laughs> they kind of tend to do everything um, and my concern there is that when you see that kind of business come into a hamlet or a, a village or even a small town um, you know there's only so many consumer dollars to go around and there's only so many car trips that go by and only so many walking and biking trips that go by you can capture. And when you put in something, um, particularly like a dandy mart that is, you know, a cafe and a restaurant and a store and a gas station, um, that takes away a lot of the dollars that you could, that could serve multiple stores, that could serve a pizza shop and a cafe um, and a small store if you didn't have that one uh, large corporate entity basically taking all of the dollars that are available. So so you addressed that, that, you addressed that in part with your, um, with your, with your uh, square footage um, in, in, the, in, the, for, in the commercial, both Hamlet in the core and outside the core, did you not? So we, we did require small sizes, particularly for that reason to make it less likely that those kinds of businesses would locate in the Hamlet. But I think there was conversation at the last meeting of, you know, oh, if they wanted to open up, you know, half a mile outside of the Hamlet, maybe that would be okay because we don't care about the Hamlet form there. You know, it's just our drive through place and maybe we want that drive to option. Um, th that was the context that we were discussing that in. Mm -hmm. am, am I correct in hearing that, um, our issue isn't drive-throughs as much as curb cuts. Is it possible to simply have a curb cut limit? You know, <laughs> one one per whatever per street or something like that? Or is it impossible to, to do a dandy mark with only one curb cut? Um, it is possible. Uh, it, it really is. Curb cuts are really one of the largest issues um, with allowing in the limited space we have for Hamlet Center with allowing drive-throughs, the multiple curb cuts is a big deal because um, it takes a substantial portion of the lot away. Uh, if you limit it to one, you know, you're then basically requiring the circulation and looping to be behind the building um, or to the side of the building, which is an improvement. Um, it still is a substantial hole, you know, in, in getting towards uh, more of a walkable format, but it's, half or less of that impact. So it's definitely a mitigating factor. Um, I saw that Debbie had her hand up. Yeah. Uh, yes, hi. So I think Olivia maybe just mentioned that there was a survey and I'm not familiar with that survey. Who got that yeah. survey? And maybe you could speak on that for a minute for those of us who are just joining. I do see that there's some other people that have joined that were not in the last meeting, which I did watch on Zoom. And so I think that there is maybe some growing interest in the community about what's going on on this committee. Yeah. Um, so the, there's 
a survey that I created this week um, that's about allowing commercial development outside of the hamlet. So basically in the town, parts of the town that are currently zoned low density residential, um, there was some concern that you know, there may be kinds of businesses that don't fit in the hamlet that the town would still like to see or would like to be allowed. So that um, survey I'll actually put in the chat. Um, it'll take me a minute to pull it up. Um, we, but we should put it on the web page as well so people do, that yeah. hasn't happened yet, has it? So it's gone out to the 140 some odd people that signed up for updates about the zoning process. And it's also been put out to Facebook and the Danby um, and South Hill community Facebook group. Um, so but but it, hasn't been, it hasn't been in the Danby news and it's not on the Danby webpage or you know, a way that we would be able to get uh, results from a broader spectrum of Danby residents other than those that are just on this committee? Well, it's definitely gone much broader than the committee, but it, 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 you're correct that it's not on the town webpage and we can add it to the Hamlet Working Group segment of the town webpage. Um, you ought to put something on the main page that drives people to it. Okay. Take a survey, click this link. Yeah. David, this is Alyssa. We haven't gotten to chat yet, but the ag group is going to also bring up an issue of um, like businesses that might not be considered ag, but would be farming support businesses and where those might be able to go in the town. I know it's a bit late to add it to the survey, but it would be great if wider swaths of the town also might consider where some, some farm support businesses could go. And um, I'll bring it up more uh, mm -hmm. later. Yeah, I think it. I think it's covered though, that the possibility is covered in the way the survey is currently structured. Listen. I saw the light industrial. Yeah, and retail. But, but yeah. I think that also it'd be worth making the point that far, uh, su support businesses for farming specifically, people might feel differently about for those who want to continue having ag in town as compared to what comes to mind for light industrial. It might not, yeah. it might not evoke the same things for people, but. Mm -hmm. Or also like farm stands because I know the my neighbor at 1849 is interested or was interested last year in having some kind of a farm stand, um, and I I don't know whether she would need a permit for that or whether that's already permitted right there, in um, yeah, it's in there yeah, downtown. Mm -hmm. It is in the existing zoning farm stands up to 400 square feet, um, which is pretty small. Um, but it is listed, listed. That doesn't mean it doesn't need a permit. It still would need a permit, um, but it is allowed. Uh, Ted, I see your hand has been up. Sure. Uh, we were getting a little bit away from um, drive throughs So I'd like to make a couple of observations and then a suggestion. First of all, we have, we are talking about the Hamlet. We are talking about a uh, David, correct me if necessary, 500 feet worth of, worth of road frontage on either side. Um, there's not a lot of space for, for drive-throughs at all. Second, that the examples you gave us were of businesses, just speaking from my perspective, that we don't have any, com most of them, we're, we don't have any compelling need for them in the Hamlet, and I would hope that we wouldn't find such a need in the future. Now, if a bank, maybe. But I see it very unlikely that any bank would want to put more than an ATM in, 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 in an area like, like Danby. And finally, we are trying to encourage a walkable hamlet. That's the whole point here. And I don't really understand why we, we would want to put a service which is take up space and everything for something which is oriented toward the automobile. Um, I think I, you know, if people have other people have opinions, that'd be great. But I, I think this is, I get the feeling this is kind of a manufactured topic. Why don't we just raise a straw hands in a straw poll, see who really wants to continue talking about drive throughs Is it necessary? I'd like to go Catherine way in here. Um, and just before we jump to Catherine, um, Ted, it's about um, 1800 feet of frontage, um, which is still fairly small, but 
more than one. Does that include both sides of the road? No, that's one side of the road that includes both Hamlet Center, both Hamlet Center zones. Wait, wait a second. I for uh, when we were talking Hamlet, I thought we were basically talking the inner Hamlet within yeah. the um, between the park and the church. That's eighteen hundred feet. That's about a thousand feet, and then the area around the gallery is another eight hundred. Ah, I. In what I'm saying, I think it applies anyway. But in what I was saying, I was just picturing what the, the, the central, central Hamlet, the, the real core of it. Yeah. Now, Catherine. Catherine. Go ahead, Catherine. Unless you're frozen. I think Catherine frozen. might be frozen. Let me just okay. chime in that when we were discussing okay. drive through, I thought I, I'm only going to say that this subject. Um, can you not hear me? Oh, wait a minute. Can you hear me now? No, you're, you're garbled. Sorry, Catherine, we can't hear you. Uh, you might put I turn my off your video. They hear me, I see me, but. Turn off the video. Turn, turn, off, the video. turn off the video. You might have a better chance of being heard. I'll, I'll. <laughs> so sorry. So sorry. So let me just chime in real quick here. I agree with Ted. When I thought of a drive-through, I was thinking of an ATM no, and I not a food do. place. Okay, I'm going to chime in quick. I'm going to chime in quick. The, the reason I asked you, David, about that particular issue, the, the drain on, 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 um, on demand was partly because of my experience watching Candor over 25 years. Mm -hmm. The dandy market in Candor, I think, made it impossible. There were five different restaurants and a market that tried to make it over those 25 years. Every one of them failed. And that's can and that's Candor, where there actually is people in traffic. Yeah, you betcha. You right. betcha, Ted. I, I, I think you're agreeing with me. <laughs> Completely. Well, the Marabito is the same as the Dandy Mart, too. Yep. Yep. Um, hey, Catherine, that looks good. Uh, Debbie, I see your hand is up. Well, I just wanted to uh, agree with this whole notion that, you know, that to have such a, uh, any kind of commercial business, let alone an entire downtown Trumansburg on 96B, seems rather unrealistic. And, um, you know, again, business, it's, they're not enough people and they're not, nobody's going to make any money and they're not going to want to be doing it. So I'm not quite sure why the town is spending so much time and energy and money, I guess, I'm curious about how much money we're spending on this project um, to uh, talk about something that's never going to even happen. Well, never is a long time, but. I'll just say, Debbie, this is Alyssa. Um, I'm really excited for the possibility to just let people have the option of doing a business. And if they fail, they fail. But some of us are really hopeful that it'll give people the chance to try if the zoning allows them to try. But you don't even live in Danby. Oh, You're pretty close. <laughs> well, close is not in. Yeah, but I'm, I'm uh, I went to one of those people driving through. And I um and I went to Ithaca City Schools and my parents work in Danby and my part or in Ithaca, my partner works in Ithaca and we go through all the time and are dedicated. Okay, so I will say that I uh, worked for the Ithaca Bakery for over 30 years and I am familiar with the Danby Mart and its successes and its failures. So I do come from a background in retail. Yeah, now Catherine's back and we try again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I went back to my real computer <laughs> and the only, I was bringing up the issue of the 
in response to why are we even talking about it is because at one of our earlier meetings, uh, Lynn, I, this is awful to say, it's Lynn brought it up. And when he did, it occurred to me that one of the things that not having a drive through of any kind or, uh, until Sarah suggested a drive up where somebody can come out, um, it cuts out anybody disabled. And, I, and that concerned me a lot when she, when he said that, that was the first thing I thought about. When we say no, 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 then we're, we're cutting out a certain part of our population. And the other, other thing about this, this is not about today, tomorrow, next week, or next year. This is long-term. So there are many, many things that can be done with, with um, architectural review. It, these are just possibilities and then, as Alyssa just alluded to, the idea that somebody has an opportunity to try is where we are. So anyway, back to that drive through or drive up or serve the person from the car. Um, you know, maybe the person comes in, drives up to the cafe, gets their coffee cup, goes to the parking lot, and parks, gets out and carries the coffee around and goes and spends a bunch of money in all our other, other shops. For us to decide how people will spend the money is unfortunate and on you know we just don't know what's going to happen these are all good open dreaming and hopes you know I, i'm not against discussing this pat yeah i think it's a good idea to consider it um i think it's a good idea to have the option open but you have to have it reviewed carefully because <laughs> We don't really know now exactly how somebody might present something that actually might make more sense than we think now. If we allow that option, then if something happens in the future, we don't restrict it. The major purpose of the zoning is to keep things open so that we can get what we want in the future instead of making sure we can. If we, if we make it too restrictive, then we guarantee up front that they can't possibly do it. So I'd like to have it set up so um, that that would be harder to do, but not impossible to do. Thanks, Pat. Ted, I see you raise your hand. Yeah, I, just to respond to Pat, uh, reviews, however hard we make them, are basically checklists. If you meet the qual, the if you meet the list of check, you know of things you have to check off, you get it. Um, in other words, you, <laughs> in order to make it something that it, to substitute a strict a stiff review for we don't want it doesn't work because someone can meet it if they're willing to, and yeah. that's Murphy's law. If it can go wrong, it will. And I, I don't think I think that's fine. I don't. I would not want something to be up to the decision of five people at one point in time only. That's a terrible way to do it. Terrible. But if you have re, if you put in the uh, the regulations that make it more likely you'll have somebody can do it and still not be harming or making annoying to everybody else, then that makes sense. So yes. I think it's it would have to have careful regulations and we don't just say it's possible, you have to have careful regulations about how. And that's of course the point of what uh, David's presentation at the beginning here was a, uh, you know, was aimed at is that we, um, we, can, we can mitigate it if you want to allow it at all. And um, David, did you have in mind a particular set of mitigations that you think would be some, a reasonable compromise? Um. So I, Kim does have her hand up, but I, I will say what I would suggest is um, being uh, as strict as possible, um, requiring uh, only one curb cut or um, kind of like the subway where if it's on a corner, you can have a second curb cut that's out of the way, um, making sure it's behind the building, having design requirements, which we already do have some design requirements, um, not allowing a parking lot on the side, forcing it to be behind so you're not losing a whole bunch of width um, to a drive aisle and, and parking. Um, so something as close as possible to that uh, subway example from Saratoga. Um, 
is I think kind of the lowest impact. Uh, but I do also like the idea of, you know, it, if it's going to be kind of one of the sooner things, if we really want it to happen, if we wanted, you know, someone like Colleen, who was at our last meeting and owns a coffee business in the city, to try something um, somewhere and allow it in a way that's easy, for that, I like the kind of interim or successional approach where you allow more of a temporary, really small building. Um, and then when it gets bigger, it has to it has to be a little more people friendly. Right, uh, but David, did you not say that that subway in Saratoga was not a drive through I did not say that, um, but- Was there a drive through there? I don't think there is, but you certainly could have one because it has a drive aisle along the back. I think that's a configuration that would work. Uh, Kim. Yeah, um, I really appreciate you finding all of these pictures and examples to help us understand what we're talking about. Um, and I think bouncing back to what Ted had said before for having about 500 feet on each side over towards the church and then another 100, 800 feet over towards the gallery, it really does seem like a, a really small amount of space to be having drive-throughs. And, and I guess the question is, you know, if a drive-through, I think, you know, there's a lot of good points. Catherine's point was great about the possibility of accessibility. Um, but we're talking about putting them in or keeping them out of the hamlet now. Isn't that correct? So if we were to put it, I mean, who knows what's going to happen with the property that Rick Dobson owned? that would be an excellent opportunity for a drive-through depending on what happens with developing it some year. Um, you know, there's other areas even south of the hamlet, like on the corner of, oh, what is that? Michigan Hollow Road. Um, there's that sort of empty lot that actually has a curb cut there. Um, you know, I mean, that could become a bank or something small like that. It could enter on Michigan Hollow and then come out on, on Danby Road. It would probably need a light or something like that. If the people who have the, um, the field that's down below where um, Ted and Pamela's sign for beginning the adopt a highway is, um, you know, that could become a whole little area down there, a whole shopping center, hopefully positive, um, but that would be more of a driving type of thing. So, but my question is, aren't we trying to talk about the Hamlet and not so much outside and wouldn't the drive-through be more appropriate for outside of the Hamlet? So we, we are talking about the Hamlet, um, the Hamlet Center and the Hamlet Neighborhood Zones. Uh, I think a lot of the area you just mentioned is in the Hamlet Neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, where the current proposal also wouldn't allow drive-throughs. Um, okay. And I think maybe that's one of the, the main pieces of feedback that I got on the Hamlet Neighborhood was that people thought it was too strict on businesses and that more businesses should be allowed um, I conceived of that as, you know, really a mostly residential um, zone with some flexibility on corners um, and, you know, more flexibility for businesses that are home-based than we currently have. Um, but I think what I've heard from the group is that people are comfortable with more businesses than I really thought they would be, or honestly, than I would suggest in a, in a residential neighborhood context. Well, I don't think that's actually true. I think that most of us have voiced a lot of concerns and one of them is water. So if you have a McDonald's or a Dandy Mart or something like that, you're going to need piped in water. Every place where you find a Danby Mart, they have piped in water. And I would be, we have no one here on this panel that actually lives in the Hamlet. And I, speaking for them, I hope, uh, they would be concerned if somebody came in, even uh, with some sort of small place, and started using up a lot of the water and providing them with a deficit of, of water. Uh, we wouldn't be able to mitigate that, I don't think. So we have to be very careful about what businesses we allow in the Hamlet, and, and they need to be businesses that are going to be willing to conserve water. 
I don't think a dandy Minimar uses a whole lot of water, but um, it, uh, we fortunately we had the aquifer study, which we didn't have you know, 20 years ago. It gives us some idea what our capacity is. Although it's limited, uh, the hamlet straddles the, the, that, that uh, water bearing uh, confined aquifer that has reasonable capacity. Have you ever been in one of these? Go down to Cander and go into the uh, place right there at the main intersection before the speed limit changes to 30 oh, and see all, see all the cooking that they do and all of the water that they have to use for that. They provide bathroom services, not only to their employees, but to the people that come in and eat. You know, and if they have, you know, if some of them have car washing facilities, then you have that kind of water use. It's, there, there can be a lot of water used by one of those things. Mm -hmm. well, oh, lack of public water may keep them out. Yeah. It, may. it may. Yeah, may. So I, I think, and I do want to want to give some um, credence to the people who have said, you know, how much time do we want to spend discussing this? It, it was definitely something that was asked for at the previous meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like we've talked through kind of what there is to consider and maybe we can um, make a decision of if we want to think more about including drive-through businesses um, or if we want to stick with kind of what is proposed in the draft, which is no drive-through businesses. Um, if we want to continue to do more, then in the next draft that I share, I'll put to put in some of those requirements that I suggested um, for siting. And you know, we talked about increased site plan review um, with with those those specific requirements. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just have a you know as long as the neighbors and the planning board agree kind of scenario. It has to be either there's specific things that we look at and require or, or it's not allowed or it's just allowed. Um, so uh, I, I think with that, I'd like to maybe go around and have everyone say if they would like to go further with drive-throughs being allowed or stick with them not allowed. Um, and uh, maybe we'll start with Rhonda. I'll just call people out. No, except for the possibility of an ATM or something very small like that. Okay, Pat. Oh, sorry, you are muted. I got it. <laughs> I'd like to um, uh, look at the possibility of allowing it. Okay, thanks, Pat. Uh, John. Uh, yes, hey. yes. Hey, which one? Which one? John. <laughs> you go, John. Uh, okay. Um, yes, with uh, uh, strong limitations, restrictions. Thanks, John. Other John? Uh, only tiny little things like that coffee house. So <laughs> I, that really is a no mm -hmm. in the central, in the core. Mm -hmm. And then on the outskirts, the same sort of what John just said, John Jensen, restrictions. It, so in the core, Nothing but maybe that cute little tiny coffee place with zero curb cuts, and in the in the non-core, uh, serious restrictions. Okay, um, uh, Kim, and then Olivia. Um, I, I agree with John Zisk. I think um, you know, if we're, are we able to make a, a dichotomy between the two hamlets, the inner and the um, outer? I would say nothing and no drive-throughs in the inner and, and strong restrictions in the outer. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Olivia? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, I wouldn't restrict it entirely. I would make sure though that there are very, very strong um, reviews um, if it's and, and uh, reducing curb cuts and things like that. Yeah. Okay, Leslie? I, I agree, not 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 in the core and and outside of the core on um, really strict expectations. Okay, uh, Ted and then Joel. Uh, in the core, in the center of the hamlet, 
no way. And although I don't really look forward to seeing something like that in the less dense part of the Hamlet, I wouldn't stand in the way of it. I just wouldn't like it. Joel? I, I thought Jonathan just summarized my position quite well. Good job, Jonathan. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, you, Joel. Sarah also agrees. You didn't with, even know with John. <laughs> um, Catherine. Yeah, I I agree with Jonathan and John Jensen, <laughs> um, but I I would have one small caution if we we don't want to get to the point with where the Hamlet is so restricted and so small that we allow more in the outer part, and that's where everybody spends their time and money. Mm -hmm. I, it's just something to consider. I, it's not a, you know, that's it. Yep. I think we have to be open and res and very careful about um, design reviews, etc. So I'm probably Thank a you. yes, like this, a yes. <laughs> uh, Debbie. <laughs> Uh, well, again, for those of us that are new to this meeting, we don't seem to have a very good understanding of the inner and the outer Hamlet and which Hamlet you're referring to. And um, I have tried to look on the town web page to look at some of the maps and such. They have a lot of pretty colors, but they don't have any names of roads. So it's kind of difficult to orientate yourself. And so it's difficult to even imagine what you guys are talking about since, again, I don't feel like the public has been well informed about this process. Uh, well, I can share with you real quickly. Um, I zoom out here and turn off some stuff. Uh, when we're talking about the central Hamlet, we have 96B here, Hillview Road. Um, the light orange is what we're calling the Hamlet neighborhood and the dark orange is the Hamlet core. So the Hamlet core is quite small, centered around Bald Hill Road um, and between Hornbrook and Gunderman. Um, in the West Danby Hamlet, it's also a relatively small area um, centered uh, on 34 and Valley View at the uh, kind of five-way intersection there. Pretty small around it is the core and then the neighborhood is a larger area. Both of those are defined um, with half mile radius circles um, from those kind of core points essentially. And it's a process that um, has been just as someone new, if you, if you are curious, we've been working on this really for a, a year now, but since I started about six months and ramped up the, the process and the speed with which we're working and the amount of public outreach we're doing um, around March when uh, the town passed a moratorium on development. So since then there's been um, weekly emails. We've had uh, well over a hundred people sign up for that email list, which you can do on the town's homepage to make sure you get all those emails. Um, there's a meeting every Friday. It rotates between this group and the conservation working group um, and is also shared on Facebook to get it as far as we, we can. And we really are asking everyone to share as much as they can. So if you know people who don't know about it yet, um, and I, it is also talked about in all of the Danby area news is I know that uh, both Joel and Ted have had articles about it there so that people um, can know to look for it. So we're doing what we can to make sure people know about it. Yeah, sorry, okay, so sorry to I, interrupt. I just wanted to say in terms of those maps, it would be great if we could get that um, maybe links of those that have, I don't know, roads. It's a little bit difficult, even when you were showing it to me now, I'm still really not sure what the inner and outer hamlets are. And in the West Danby Hamlet, is that an oh, yeah. inner hamlet or an outer hamlet? And I just, for your information, David, um, again, that I have been a pretty long-term resident here in Danby and I have participated in these hamlet discussions back in 2008 mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I live on the on the Bald Hill Road that was discussed as the, one of the Hamlet desirable locations right behind my house. Uh, so, um, and again, 
you know, I was involved in these conversations in the past and, you know, I don't know, how many meetings have you had so far? Maybe you could tell me that. Quite a few. <laughs> you know, one every week for at least three months. So, mm. um, and an additional town board meeting every month since March. So it's, it's a lot of meetings. And, um, and I guess the other question too, is I have kind of heard this excited pace that you guys are working on and or timeline and various things like that. And I'm kind of curious is what's the hurry and why is that? Thank you. Yeah, if, if I could stick in two cents, um, seeing the maps reminded me of a nuance that I did not state earlier. Uh, I, I, I still don't like drive throughs in the core hamlet, the little area, the 500 feet in downtown Danby. 511 I measured with them. Um, but uh, I would restrict my acceptance of drive throughs in the larger hamlet to the state routes. I, I can't see, for example, a drive through on Bald Hill Road, for example, which is in, in, in the greater hamlet. Mm -hmm. And we don't, and your example, again, I, I went and looked at the example of, that you gave of the Tompkins Trust in Cortland. And interestingly, its depth would fit between 96B and the park. It would take up one fifth of the total 500 feet if it were in the, in the center hamlet. I know we're not talking the center hamlet, but it, it assumes the presence of not only a side road, but a alley off of the side road. And that, that's, that's, that's a level that I don't see happening, but that's just me. Thanks. Uh, I think we have two people left who haven't chimed in, and uh, one of them is Kelly. And Kelly, I know you you joined later, so you may not know where we are. And the other is Laura and Casey. Sarah. Um, hi, I'm Casey. Uh, I've just been listening because I have a toddler running around, and it's bedtime. But um, I live next door to Debbie on Bald Hill Road, um, and. This is my first meeting, so I'm just getting oriented to everything too. But um, yeah, I think what is my biggest question is kind of the because I've been looking at those maps and stuff. The diff like what, and I appreciate Ted's comment about the difference between what the core is and the neighbor, the Hamlet neighborhood. Because I'm in the neighborhood, not the core, um, and so and I think maybe that's one of sounds like maybe one of Debbie's questions too. Like, you know, I'd love to have a coffee shop next to the church or something that I could walk to. Um, I don't want a gas station in my backyard, you know, so I think, you know, it sounds like everybody here has, you know, I think I agree with your guys's, you know, largely opinions about, you know, drive throughs or whatnot. Um, I guess it, my biggest question is what does the Hamlet neighborhood mean um, and sort of what are the differences between what's being discussed for the core versus what would be allowed in, in the neighborhood zone, I guess. Yeah, great. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to everyone um, to the Hamlet working group page that has a link to the most recent map and the most recent draft of the zoning. And I, I wanna reiterate um, I say this every time, but it's very much a draft and we are changing it in each of these meetings. And actually there's a few changes from previous meetings that haven't been made yet, but um, it's very much not written in stone. So if you see something you don't like, come back to the next meeting and let us know. Um, and that, that's how we're making adjustments here. Um, I, I will say for the benefit of Cassie and Debbie, um, the main thrust of the proposals is um, to make uh, the hamlet, both hamlets, the Central Danby Hamlet and the West Danby Hamlet, the places that are that make the most sense to build, um, so that we can use um, kind of revitalize and and bring uh, development to the parts of town that make the most sense. Um, and so we're trying to make it easier. Um, to have a variety of housing types and um, also customers for businesses that we could get in the, the small central area. And we're trying to keep it very much Hamlet scale um, in the, the kind of realm of traditional Hamlets and villages around upstate New York. So that's kind of our, our guidepost. So I am gonna 
jump to that and post it in the chat. Um, and it's it's time for Kelly. Kelly, we were just going around and everyone is um, saying if they uh, would like us to pursue having some allowance in the zoning for drive-throughs in the hamlets. Um, so far, most people have said uh, no or yes, but very, very strict requirements um, and only outside of the core of the hamlet. Um, yeah, I was kind of, I did the survey. I was a little torn. Like I, we, I think we discussed last time about like a uh, Burger King versus like in Cortland, you find like Fort coffee mania, which is like a hundred square foot little shack on the corner lot that people drive mm -hmm. through. So I think, um, a lot of the different things in the survey, I was kind of torn between different size requirements, but I, the drive through was one that uh, I personally was feeling was probably not very likely to be something sorry something we would have um and that if we were to even like entertain it at all that it would be very strict review so just my personal opinion blah 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 <laughs> blah that was cute. <laughs> We're like an hour late for bedtime, so. Oh. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, so I think that is. Um, How about Sarah? Post to a consensus, really. Yeah, Sarah posted. Did she like John also? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it does seem like we have a, a pretty strong consensus there. Um, so I will make some adjustments to our next draft. Um, and uh, I think we can set aside this topic for this meeting um, and maybe move on to other concerns. Uh, and Kim added in the chat, I'm wondering if discussion of potential additional municipal parking being set aside for the need of cars for future urban development in the Hamlet would be helpful. I can't see parallel parking plus sidewalks fitting there. I'm also wondering if that corner lot across from the DMV church would be a good place to invite a food truck sometime. Um, so Kim, I think right now we actually have so much municipal parking compared to the size of the Hamlet. We're you know, a decade from needing any more um, between the town hall and the park and ride um, and uh, the park, which isn't municipally owned, but it's still public. There's way more parking than I can conceive of us needing anytime soon. Um, there is room, there's actually a lot of room for sidewalks and um, parallel parking. Uh, which would have shoulders are so wide there's plenty they're of room so, yeah they're incredibly wide um so we, we there definitely is room for that but that's i think something for the future but um, one of the things that we haven't talked about and this is something people bring up a lot of times they say oh i wish we had a post office mm -hmm. and of course we are never going to get a post office it was taken away back in the 60s but the US Postal Service has little walk-in places. And I have also hoped that there would be a place where you could go and maybe buy stamps or uh, they have you know, a self-service way in for packages and things like that. And also, um, I, you know, there is, uh, for a lot of people, a need for a place to drop off uh, FedEx and UPS <laughs> packages. Now, when you drop them off at um, the dollar store in Spencer, and have done that, uh, because someone required me to do that, uh, they don't give you a receipt. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm giving you this package of documents someone's mortgage here in this package and I'm handing this to you and you're telling me it's going to be picked up by FedEx, uh, but you're not giving me a receipt. I got kind of nervous. I would have preferred to have had just a plain old drop-off box or something. If there's ever any way that we can have some sort of place for all of these things in a self-service post office, 
uh, that might help. Otherwise, you have to drive all the way into town. Oh, we will see them. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll see if it's only open until 12 o'clock, I think, or one o'clock. And even Spencer is only open until 1230, I think. Boy, I have been to every post office around and they're very limited these days. You have to go all the way up to a lot of times all the way up to the near the airport to go to the post office and to really get decent service with FedEx you have to go all the way up to the airport so mm. this would be a good adjunct businesses for if we had a business for them to be adjunct too <laughs> um, uh, this is one of my favorite new neighborhoods in the country um, and their post office is kind of what Rhonda is describing it's it's people's PO boxes and some self-serve stuff, um, um, but it's part of their their little downtown, which is really wonderful. Um, this was all built new in the 90s, um, but it, it can be something as small as basically this is a space for all of their, their mailboxes for a development. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it is, unfortunately, as much as I like talking about that, getting a little away from uh, the zoning that, that we should have. I think those are things that would be allowed in the Hamlet core just under retail. Um, so I, I was trying to decide what other than drive-throughs um, we wanted to talk about tonight. And I, I thought we could go to, uh, and I'll, I'll hold for comments on this, but go to the comments that I have um, from Joel and Olivia. They're the two people who've sent me um, track changes comments in the document uh, and we could walk through them and maybe start with a brief overview of the document for the people who are new. Um, so with your permission, uh, we can just chime in if there's something else more pressing that anyone thinks we need to deal with first. Nope, okay. I'm going to share that screen. All right. So for the for the benefit of Debbie and uh, Casey, I hope I'm not forgetting people's names because I can't see them now that I'm in the document. Um, the draft um, zoning is really just an, an initial start. There's two zones. One is the Hamlet Center Zone and one is the Hamlet Neighborhood Zone. Um, and as I zoomed around the two maps before, these apply uh, basically to the, the Hamlet Center Zone is the historic core of the central Danby Hamlet um, and also a core in the West Danby Hamlet. Um, and then most of the area around them is the Danby Hamlet Neighborhood. Um, for each zone, um, there, there's kind of the same set of rules. There's the intent of the zone, um, lot sizes, permitted uh, uses. Um, Joel suggested that we change this to permitted buildings and uses, um, permitted accessory uses, uses by site plan approval, setbacks, um, rules for allowing multiple primary uses and buildings mixing into kind of a campus type lot um, form requirements. This is something that's new um, and um, landscaping requirements and sign rules. So there's that for both of the zones. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, the goal here is really that we want, if people are gonna be building new homes in Danby, we really want to encourage them to be in the Hamlet. So we're trying to make that as easy as possible. Um, so I, I think we can start looking at comments here. Um, and I, I think one of the first comments um, from Joel, and I've gotten this comment from others as well, is that I didn't um, put in this um, specifically allowing agriculture. Um, and I, I think that that is something we should talk about. I think that there is, it does make sense to continue allowing agriculture um, it may not be the long-term future of especially the Hamlet core, um, but I, I'm not sure that anyone has anything against 
um, the agricultural practices that have been going on in the um, the areas that we've designated as Hamlet Core, or Hamlet Neighborhood, and I think that that will continue in a lot of the Hamlet Neighborhood for quite some time. Um, a, because a question, question. Go ahead. Tom. Um, I, I I have nothing against a few chickens, um, but realizing that the Hamlet Core itself well, we would like it to be fairly dense, certainly by dandy standards. Um, I'm thinking of all of the uh, stories I've read about people in downtown Ithaca or other urban areas objecting to the noise of a particularly feisty rooster, for example. Um, are we headed for trouble that way? Well, we've got, uh, we've got nothing right now that, that uh, addresses that potential nuisance. And it's not, of course, limited to the Hamlet core where that might be an issue. It could be an issue in any, any one of our quote unquote suburban neighborhoods as well. It um, could, it could. But the, it the, probably should the be tolerant. addressed specifically, you know, and, and maybe maybe that will be dealt with in our, with our, our noise committee that's, that's, that's looking into what do we do about, you know, uh, objectionable noise. Um, a rooster could be a problem. I've got a rooster across the street from me, but it's a, the breed is such that it's not so loud that it's disruptive, but you can't guarantee that. You know. Two roosters, even worse. <laughs> well, yeah, right. But it, however, I mean, but I, but, but I kind of like the fact that you've got chickens across the street and, they, and they're, you know, they're free range and they're out by the road and it's part of the character of the neighborhood, even though it's right in the middle of West Danby. <laughs> Well, yeah. Olivia had peacocks. And and uh, for what it's worth, uh, Beaners, Brian Beaners has, I hesitate to say what they are, ducks, geese, whatever they are. And um, yes, right. Muscovy ducks. Yes, and they, um, they certainly keep the speed limit down on Bald Hill Road. Well, someone killed one of them. Well, the, the others are still doing their job as policemen. Yeah, so yeah I, I, I like that as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't dislike it. It just that it, 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 the closer together you are, the more these issues come up. Well, I have turkeys and so dad likes to stand out in the road during breeding season and just, uh, you know, display to the passers by. <laughs> and some of them have passed him by for sure. And I go out there and yell at him to get out of the road. So, yeah, birds are an issue. That's rural mm -hmm. character. <laughs> That's right. Rural character. Yeah. Okay. Um, David, I, I guess I wanted to try to raise my hand. I could do that when you had your screen up. Um, but going back to what you just said, which is the goal is to have people move to the hamlet. I have a quest couple questions in regards to that. First off is um, what are the current lot requirements from the health department in order to support the well and septic systems for let's say a single family home? And uh, I, I'm under the impression that part of this um, Hamlet is looking to perhaps deal with this water septic situation. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that for those of us that are new here and I'll probably have a follow-up question after that, thank you. Sure, Debbie. Um, so a few things there. One is that um, we've actually said it right in the in the zoning. Right now, the health department is the most restrictive control on how dense development can be. Um, and they, they have different ways of dealing with it. So for if you are going to put in an unengineered just standard septic and well system, they want you to have two acres for a lot. Um, you can engineer a system on a much smaller lot using different technologies that are can be more expensive, um, do require uh, different maintenance, but you can you can get much smaller with with that way. Um, our goal here is for the zoning to not um, not be an additional limit on size. So just have the health department's rules be 
um, the major limitation of size because they are really a significant barrier. Um, one of the things that we have been talking about, uh, particularly for the core of the hamlet, to be able to get you know, something vaguely resembling a hamlet or village center um, is that we are trying to find a way to allow off-site septic, to allow a lot that's too small because we have some historic lots that are too small in the kind of main core of the hamlet, um, particularly right at the intersection of Bald Hill and 96B, you know, where there used to be a store where we would like to see some development filling out that corner that is just impossible unless you have some way to treat water off site. Um, so the town uh, won a grant uh, to work with an engineer on that. Um, we're actually hopefully the town board will approve a resolution to go forward and accept that grant on Monday. Um, uh, so that will help us look at what capacity there is and what creative ways we can come up with for having a density greater than one house per two acres um, to really be able to have a hamlet because otherwise it's pretty much impossible. So I, th I think that's a really good point. It's, it's what we're working on. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, so my understanding of what you just said is that the town board is voting on Monday in order to accept a grant that would look into options rather than maintaining the two acre lot, right? Yep, basically and, shared and, and systems. The shared systems. And so then following up on that shared systems is then the town would then be in the water and sewer business for uh, the, for the Danby Hamlet located on 96 and uh, similar to perhaps like the water district of West Danby. Correct. Well, correct. And I, and I just, well, wait, I'm sorry. Is that not correct? It's, it's correct. not, well, it's well. not quite correct. I, we're not proposing a, a system that would necessarily serve existing residents um, because my understanding is most people's septic systems are fine and they don't want to pay for a new system. Um, we're looking at ways that we can serve lots that could use development. Um, and of course, if somebody, you know, has a septic issue and needs to get on a system, uh, that would also be possible. But my understanding is that there aren't a lot of existing residents that need a system now. It's really if we want to be able to enable development. Um, oh, okay. So... The West Danby water system, as I just read in last uh, month, this current month's uh, uh, Danby News, seemed to have had some problems. I'm not sure what you're alluding to. I'm not, there are no problems that I'm aware of. Didn't they say that there was a leak? Oh, yeah, there was a leak. I mean, I think it watered. Water and systems that we, have we leaks. went through 97,000 gallons of water when normal usage is 10,000. So yeah, that's what happens when you have a leak. You know, you get a water main break, you lose a lot of water before you can right. get it fixed. So I under I so I don't understand why the town wants to get involved in the water sewer business when it's somewhat problematic in the current right. situation in West Danby. Well, the re the reason we would want to get involved is to enable the kind of Hamlet development that we've been that we that is envisioned in the comprehensive plan. You know, you can't have a Hamlet if you're going to be stuck with uh, individual well and septic. Uh, it, the, the density just isn't there. It, it's it's all you can do is is just suburban style sprawl. Right, and I understand that many people are uh, opposed to suburban style sprawl, um, but I have suggested in the past, going back many years, that really if we need any additional housing to generate revenue or whatever the reasons are for wanting more people in the town of Danby that it would be better suited to do that on the Ithaca line where the water system is already either in place or close to being in place. Well, that's not what we have been aiming for and nor is it division in the comprehensive plan. Also in my mind, it's, it might not be a profitable business, but utilities like water, sewer, exactly what we should be looking into as a town. 
in my opinion. Sarah, you were kind of cutting out there, but I think the gist of what you were saying is that providing those kind of community services is really one of the jobs of a town. That's what I heard too. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we talked about. Go ahead, Provide Joel. water for the whole town. It, it's, it's looking at interesting, innovative systems that might help uh, with clustering um, or, right. or uh, you know, concentrated, so a concentrated neighborhood or something, not, not town-wide, my understanding. Right, although it could also enable small clusters like an eco-village. Yeah. My That's feeling what I said. is that yeah. if you're planning <laughs> on putting in, I mean, if your actual plan, even though it's not been stated, is that you want to put in some sort of a water system like in West Danby, even for the hamlet, mm -hmm. at the cost of all of the residents in the town of Danby, I think you Rhonda, should. Rhonda, that's that not at all what here. anyone is suggesting. That's not what anyone is it's suggesting not. at all. Okay. Um, so maybe we could get back to the draft. Um, I, this question of, uh, of allowing agriculture, it wasn't in the previous draft. It is currently allowed. Um, and I got uh, several comments that it should continue to be allowed. And um, I think that's a good idea. And uh, unless anyone has significant um, problems with that, I think we can move forward with that change. Okay. What's an in incidental structure? Um, it's structures that are related to that use. So for agriculture, that would be like a barn or a, um, you know, a shelter for animals or basically any, any building that's related to that use. So we're talking about having this in the hamlet? Yes. Yep. Where they already exist and where historically yep. they were located also. Yep. Um, and I, I do agree that that is very much part of the character of the area. So I, I'm glad that someone pointed that out. Um, the next question um, was about accessory structures. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand uh, where we went with this, this height. Oh, I think that was for Joel. Um, does this include agricultural buildings? So we kind of dealt with that. Yeah, we dealt with that one. So uh, we're talking about manure and things like that in the hamlet. <clears throat> yes or no? Yeah, I mean, manure doesn't, I mean, manure hasn't got anything to do with the buildings, but it does have to do with the use. I use manure regularly. It's my, it's my go-to fertilizer. Well, but we're not talking about you fertilizing your garden. We're talking about... Yeah, we are. Uh, that's we're not talking what about continuing the allowed about. use that's been allowed. Um, that's rural character. I'm sorry. You want rural character, that's it. Spreading we're talking about specifically the smells in the hamlet. A wonderful smell for rural character. We know you don't like it, Rhonda, and other people don't, but it's rural character. Well, now, are, are we talking what about, the about gardening? In the yeah, are we talking well, about gardening? In the hamlet. Yeah, are we talking about gardening quantities or um, or uh, cleaning out the barn quantities? Uh, it really depends mm. on the land that somebody has. You know, right now, this has been allowed for all of history. Um, it's exactly not a problem at all. If somebody who had large property with a barn wanted to have some horses and they would create manure, that's what horses do. Um, and that's currently allowed. And the proposal is to continue allowing it as part of the yeah. character. Of and, and horse manure doesn't smell quite as bad as cow manure or pigs. Or yeah, pigs. It's quite reasonable in the wider hamlet. Yeah. I mean, the, the two houses down from me uh, a number of years ago, it didn't have done anymore. Um, one of my neighbors had uh, two pet pigs. Yep. 
So I, it, I, I have think a we're... quick question in the opposite direction, if it's okay. I know I hope yeah. I'm not prolonging this too long. Um, so the one thing, the one question I have is, do we have any regulation over, like if someone only owns two acres, which I've never had horses, so I don't know what's appropriate exactly, but you sometimes drive past some of these properties like in Virgil and Locke where it seems like it's half an acre or a quarter of an acre with that's fenced off for a horse. Um, like the opposite, like we're talking the opposite of a large operation, but like, do we have any control over people putting a large animal on a small plot if we're trying to do small plots for the Hamlet? No, we don't. I don't know if there's any, okay. No. Okay. Well, three houses down from me the, um, when I moved here, it's been, it's been a while since the horse was gone, but there used to be a barn and the barn has since fallen down, but they had a horse um, and a little bit of a pasture behind and that was mm, not much more than an acre. Yeah. Um, so maybe jumping back to um, comments, the, the permitted uses here were one to four unit residents, um, retail buildings and uses, that are under 2,000 square feet, so very small retail, um, and no drive-throughs uh, and design guidelines that we have. Um, and trying to follow the comments here. Uh, I think we, we, the comments wait until, for things we haven't talked about down until we get to vehicle parking. Um, just, just noting the wording you have there, you said no drive-through windows. Um, that's not quite the same as no drive-throughs. Okay. Sure. Just, you know, mm -hmm. don't 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 be too specific if you don't have to. Uh, sure. Point taken. Um, there was a, a question about the section on parking. So parking is an allowed accessory use for any of the allowed uses. Um, so not a parking lot that's you know, not related to a use, but any of the allowed uses can have a parking lot um, with the provision that parking is not permitted in this the core zone between the front of the building and the street. Um, and there were some questions about you know, how that can work with more of a campus style development. Um, for example, Olivia has like Olivia's two, property, right? two large lots. Um, and I, I think the answer there is that um, the you can have buildings in a kind of campus orientation where at least you have buildings along the street, but then you also have buildings farther back where parking would be in the front. So I think that's something worth clarifying. Um, would it be worth? Sorry, go would ahead. It be worth limiting the number of uh, when you say preferably behind, but allowing it to the side. Would be it be worth specifically saying you cannot have more than one car width or car length to the side? In other words, you can't have two rows of cars. Uh, uh huh. I do think that's a good idea. <clears throat> um, as much as it can be limited as possible is better. Yeah, because as soon, as soon as you say preferably the, the Murphy's Law, someone will put it to the side. Right. And then I think that having some flexibility in there is good for a site plan review um, so that they have legs to stand on, but also flexibility. But I, I like that um, not having double loaded parking lots on the side is generally useful. Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking about the downtown West Danby. Mm -hmm. And um, the traditional, the commercial building uh, was kind of like Benjamin's in Danby with the parking in front. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I were in and, and it, because of the topography, it backs up against a hill. So putting parking behind would be problematic. Um, but, but I don't think it would be unattractive if it were, if it were screen from the street so you weren't looking at a parking lot. Um, and all it would take was a hedge, you know, tall enough to hide the cars. Mm. Which is why so, I suggested. And there's also the you know, 
I, I don't generally don't like parking in front of houses either, but but um, but there are occasions where you know if if it were screened from the street, I wouldn't feel so badly about it. Basically, I don't like to look at the cars. <laughs> yeah. So um, from my perspective, this requirement is really more about urban form and less about seeing the cars. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So it it it's important to note that it. This doesn't apply to any existing parking that's there. It doesn't make people move what they already have um, and or pick up their building and move it or demolish what they already have. It would apply to new buildings. Right, new right, right. Yeah, it, it's a little uh, bit if I, like... if I had If I were going to redevelop West Danby's commercial core, um, I would take the house that's between the church and the, and the what was the store building and move it across the street or someplace else and maybe add in yet another commercial building between the two um, and the parking would be in front um, continuing what's over there but screen from the street um, that's not unlike the situation in the core of danby where between uh with, with, with olivia's property um, one might want to um, put a screen across the front that would allow for a parking lot in the middle, um, where the when the retail uses are, and retail a combination of retail and, and uh, residential uses in a semicircle or U um, around it, um, not unlike what was in her proposal. Again, though, we're looking at you know not necessarily having a building on the street frontage, um, the, the central parking lot with a little plaza-like uh, situation with the with the building surrounding a. a a, what there's essentially a parking lot in the middle, you know, even if it's treed and has screening. Um, I don't think would be such a terrible way to, to develop that property. So a question for David. Yeah. I, I'm remembering the, uh, the encouragement, uh, the 10 foot setback from the road, uh, which I think was in there create a sense of closeness in the hamlet and therefore slowing down the driving, sorry, slowing down the speed limit and et cetera. Is, is there something similar going on with the idea that you don't want parking in the front? You don't want it to, you, you want people to slow down. You want people to have to turn in and go behind the buildings. Is that true? Yeah, it is. That's, that's really why you don't want parking in front of the buildings because the, when the buildings are set farther back, it encourages speeding um, and it makes it hard to get the kind of the term that designers use for it is enclosure of the street. Um, so you really want to, to create a village feel. You need buildings on both sides of the street that make the space feel, um, you know, they, we say an outdoor room you want it to feel like a, a place instead of just space. And in order yes. to do that, the buildings need to be um, closer together across the street to, to create that sense of, of place. Um, that, that seems like a good principle. Yeah, yeah except I'm, when you've got the main, when, when you've got, a, when you've got a, the, you know, the main highway with a, with a 55 mile an hour speed limit, um, which we still have here in West Danby. Well, if if we adopt if we adopt this um, sort of uh, plan, and it begins to happen, the next thing that will happen is the Department of Transportation, twenty years from now, will decide to lower the speed limit. That's the whole point of it, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the other. Well, and we're talking specifically of the core too, right? Like we're not talking about the neighborhood. We're talking about that that core region. Yep. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so and we'll have one of those. I also think it's important to note, you know, when there's specific exceptions or reasons for a specific exemption, that's why we have a variance process. So we we set the general rules that we want um, and we want to try to minimize the need for variances. But if there's a very specific circumstance um, topographically that applies to a particular parcel, that's a great reason to grant a variance. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't talked. We haven't. We haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about downtown West Danby, but the, 
the, the, the there are two problems with trying to line the road with houses or, or our commercial buildings on both sides. The other one is the sight lines with a curve uh, that would make it that have our, that makes it difficult to, to on on the east side of the highway um, already uh, and to put anything between the intersection of Station Road South on the west on the west, on the east side of the highway uh, would would exacerbate that problem. And the two, it, I mean, that, the houses that are there now um, have all have, have both uh, arranged their driveway so that they can they've got room to turn around so they can they can face out and don't have to back into the, the onto the main highway because of the, the 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 danger associated with people coming around that corner and and and, and being you know they're right they're right on you before you have a chance to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All true. Um, so I think to come back to the zoning, um, maybe we need a, a sense of, oh, this is the wrong one. So many documents open. Um, you know, I'm not sure, Joel, it sounds like you're proposing that we should allow as a rule in all areas parking in front with screening um, which I just want to say if you do allow that that is all that you will get um, parking and, in front with parking in front with screening yeah and I have Easy. never and with screening that will not necessarily be maintained yeah I have and, never seen a situation where any screening I felt like made a positive contribution there's a yeah. And, and, part yeah, and one issue with screening is it blocks your uh, ingress back to the road. Yeah. Dangerous. Very dangerous yeah. coming back to the road. If you have screening to block cars, you can't see around it. Yeah, and pardon me. Yeah, it has to be set back far enough so it doesn't block doesn't block your uh, your sight line. Uh, I'm sorry for generalizing, but commercial development of that kind and the 55 mile an hour speed limit in West Danby and the shape of the road in the West Danby is an accident waiting to happen. I think we need to address the speed limit to uh, to meet our goals. I think we can, can work on adopting the zoning so that we can uh, get to DOT. We, we can convince DOT that we have a context that requires change um, but we have to do, we have to be taking steps to achieve that context in order for them to be able to work with us. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would share. So the city of Ithaca has screening rules um, on in their design guidelines for Route 13. And I've just always been very unhappy with the outcomes. Um, and a few of them Let's see. So one example of screening, this is screening. Ouch. <laughs> it, doesn't look screen, it doesn't look screened to me. But. Um, another example of kind of more substantial screening is this. You know, I, I feel like you might as well not even, I don't feel like it does anything. It sounds like it does something, but then it I don't know of any instances where it really does something other than cost money. And that makes planning boards feel like they did something, but it. Well, what I'm talking about is something that you can't see through. Um, so if, if it's going to be a hedge, it has to be dense enough. It's, it's, it's a hedge in a traditional sense. I mean, I've got, I've got neighbors on both sides of the street that have hedges across the front uh, between them and the highway. And they do hide the what's behind them in general how along route 13 here if you had some substantial screening or a wall or something like that how would the dot plow and what what would they do with the, all the snow well the screens that exist are on the far side of the ditch if there is one but i'm talking about on route 13 
Well, I'm talking about 96. Is, is there more screening down on Home Depot area? Is that, that where you're getting to? I think so. Um, I think mostly it's grade there. Yeah. I think there they isn't... just installed a Divisions Federal Credit Union as screening for Home Depot. Yeah, it's not it's not updated and Google has show. not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not there. But like most like most of these things that I don't find that it really serves the purpose that it's intended to replace which is having buildings out in the street. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't fill that urban design bill that it's intended to replace a building. Um, oh, that was screening in front of uh, Goodyear there. Kind of. Not really. I mean, street trees, there's not really screening. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of how, that's how, basically how it works out is I, I, there are no examples that I know of, of screening that's really terribly effective. Do you have a street view of downtown West Danby? Unfortunately, I don't think there is street view there. Um, Google doesn't love you guys enough. Let me see. Yeah, we click on Google, we don't exist anyway. Yeah. I mean, if we have small, if we have small businesses along the highways in the core, I mean, how much are people going to want to hide their business? I mean, well, you, know, you don't really want to hide the business. It's not the business I want to hide; it's the cars. So in other words, the screen doesn't have to be any higher than five oh, feet or so. the cars. Huh. Yeah. So you can look over. You know, some you can still see the facade. You still see the church. You still see the store over a five foot high screen, but you don't see huh. the cars parked behind it. If huh. it's a screen, if it's a real screen, it's kind of like what we had with with Rick Dobson when he had his junkyard. You know, we had a screening requirement, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, with the way we we worded it, it, it it allowed for the possibility of putting a chain link fence and calling it a screen. If you could see through it, it's not a screen. So we don't have street view, Joel. We do have aerial. No. I'm not sure that's okay. helpful for what you we were talking about. Somewhat. Um, talking about this hedge. Well, it, quite, it goes right across the front. I'm, right I'm there. Lost. Yeah. Is and then, the uh, and then across the street, um, you know, to, uh, there's. There's, there's, a, there's a pretty good, there's a pretty good, there's a couple of houses. Um, gosh, this is a fairly old picture because the, uh, the vegetation in front of the house across the street, it doesn't exist. But the, but the vegetation across the, uh, um, to the right of it, to the, to the, uh, to the right on that is, is very much screened from the street. You can't see the house behind it. So, you know, I, I guess that, that my question is just where, what, where do you want us to go um, to get some closure on this of, do we want to allow in the zoning without a variance parking in front of businesses in the Hamlet Center with, um, with screening? I really think for any business, you're you know you're gonna have a driveway. You're you're gonna any parking you have is not gonna be hidden if it's not if it's between the building and the street. Well, Eric Buck yeah. said there would be no parking allowed along the street so long as the speed limit was 40 miles an hour. I don't. If, think if you're gonna allow reason. if you're gonna allow businesses, you have to allow parking, and if you want businesses. You got to make it somewhat easy or you're not going to get businesses. And that's what this whole thing with the Hamlet development is trying to encourage. So I just I can't see that. I mean, I'm a landscape architect by training and I've done it. I've had my own business. Um, you're not going to get a good screen that's going to do what you want it to do. Like you're saying, David, 
the stuff downtown is not screening. It's landscaping. It's far from screening. Yeah, it um, doesn't do. It's not, it's, it's yeah. not a screen. And on the small scale that we are, you're not going to have enough distance and step back to have large screening that's going to block the vision of cars. Either we're creating a hamlet that's going to look somewhat more urban or we're not. And if you want businesses, you have to have parking. If you have parking, you got to see cars. And um, if they're out front, they're out front. And that's part of what you're creating. Um, well, I don't like, and, and, and I don't think any of us do, um, having the parking in front uh, is, is sort of in the way of developing a, a walking friendly environment. I'm just going to butt in. I can't. <laughs> so I have been, and it's been a very long time ago, very, very, very long, but I, and I, I think it was Hilton Head or someplace down there. Now, this is not what I'm recommending at all, but it is a method and that is the, 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 the road, from the road, you do not see anything except signs periodically where you enter in. And, and I've seen this in Northern Virginia also, you see signs and they tell you what- Bank outer banks is like that too. They tell you what businesses are in those areas where, where you can turn in and find them. That is that is screening, but it also blocks any business so that if somebody is driving along, they don't have any idea that there that there is something which is um, contrary to what we might be wanting in a small hamlet. So I think that what David showed us about downtown Ithaca isn't the issue about what screening or, or not, but what he said what we've been talking about is the closeness of the business to the road. Um, and if we are able to slow down the traffic, then there can be the, you know, the street parking. Um, eventually we have sidewalks, people can park on the street the way it is. And, you know, you can do that in Trumansburg. It doesn't take away from the businesses. They're right up close and personal. Um, you know, it's not one or the other. There are ways to do this. I think, I found out when I when I was first here, I started, I called the city of Ithaca because of all the ridiculous, those waving signs that wave and tear and fade and they're annoying as you know what. Well, they told me there are two people, two people in Ithaca who are the whole, everything about signs in Ithaca. They can't possibly keep up. Every single thing that is in that grass is is not permitted, but it's there anyway. So when we were talking about putting the businesses close to the street, the parking, you know, we have in our small hamlet, we have the park for parking. We have the town hall for parking. We're talking about maybe a crosswalk as Sarah suggested. Um, you know, we're talking about incremental changes, starting out with ways that will prevent some of the things like Route 13. Now I'll stop talking again. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Oh, did we lose? We lost Joel. We lost Joel. Um, I, I was going to say, like, if we're limiting signage, then that'll probably also encourage businesses on their own to be closer to the street because mm -hmm that you briefly had that one image of, I think it was in Corning, but the Burger King was way set back. And I can imagine if you were driving down that street and there weren't a major sign at the sidewalk, you would completely miss that Burger King because the other buildings are 10 feet and it's like 50 feet back. Yeah. So if, if we get to that density level that we're aiming for, they're going to be more apt to be built closer to the street just to get the attention that they want for their business to prosper. But of course that takes the development happening over time. Mm -hmm. So for now, um, I feel bad doing this with Joel gone, but is there anyone else who would like the zoning change from what it currently says, which is that parking is not allowed between the building and the street? That doesn't include street parking. If there were, if we can get street parking, that is the ideal, that's what we want. Um, but that you can't build a new parking lot in front of a building. 
Does anyone else want that changed? Well, I would ask what is in front of the building. If the some of the designs that Olivia was proposing had the buildings turned sideways from the road and the parking in front of the building. So uh, I think it has to be clarified what that what in front of the building means. I think by definition, the front is the part facing the road, even if that isn't the entrance. Yeah. But David, don't you, don't, isn't there some goal of uh, requiring the entrances to be to the front? There is, and that, that is also a, a part that Olivia and I talked about, that I think having a provision for lots that have multiple buildings um, makes sense. You know, what we're really talking about is when you add one building on a lot, the front faces the street. You know, in her circumstance where we're talking about more of a campus, you know, yes, we want buildings facing the street because you still need that street life, but you can have other buildings that face internal circulation. Right, I mean, Jason and I talked a lot about community corners and community corners, despite the fact that it's set back a ways and a lot of the buildings don't face the road, it has kind of a friendly atmosphere. It makes you want to drive in and, and shop and things like that because you can park in one place and then wander around to all the shops. And um, Is that what you call a campus? I think community corners is pretty unpedestrian friendly, um, so it's not. I, that's not really what I meant. Um, but the uh, the place we looked at up by Rochester the other day. Now I'm blanking on the name um, where there was. Basement. Yeah, um, that was more of a campus where you have some parking that serves multiple buildings. Um, another example just had on my screen but I went away from it. Um, let's see here. Where were you in Rochester? Bushnell's Basin. Oh Bushnell's Basin. Okay. Well that's not really a walking campus, sir. I don't even remember any sidewalks. There are sidewalks. On um, on one side of the street at a time, of course. Yeah. So this is kind of another example. I'm going to share a screen. Sorry, I got my router decided I shouldn't be at this meeting. Ah, I'm wondering what happened to you. So happened. this is a, kind of another screen from the internet. <laughs> what Sandy was screened. Um, this is another example of kind of a, a campus where the main street is out here, but they created a street that comes in and serves okay. to um, two buildings and there's a parking lot back here, but it, it really creates a new street frontage and campus where things have a really good pedestrian orientation. This is a place where human beings really feel comfortable. Um, well, does it require palm trees? We won't get those in there. We probably won't. It does, certainly doesn't require the palm trees, but it, it's in- They uh, require what? Palm oh, the palm trees. trees. Well, we certainly won't get palm trees. No, it's true. <laughs> Global warming. You may. <laughs> Excuse me, climate change. <laughs> this looks a lot like Dandy, I think. Yes, it's more more like what we could get. <laughs> yeah, the palm trees give it away. Um, but this is another example of how, you know, it's not only one building on the street. You can have other configurations, but what's when we're on the upper level of those buildings? Offices, yoga studios, art studios, those kinds of things. So it's not a residence then? No, this is at the entrance to a residential neighborhood. So all of these buildings are commercial, but they, I don't, there wouldn't be any problem with them being residences. But Could be residential. Not. Yeah. Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, like. What was that, Joel? It looks like South Carolina. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, this is a... a development that a gentleman measured all his favorite places in Beaufort and then went to a greenfield site far outside the city where they didn't have any zoning because none of the zoning allowed anything that he liked in Beaufort. 
mm -hmm. use those measurements to build a whole neighborhood that's like the traditional neighborhoods in Beaufort, but it's it's outside of the city there. And it's really beautiful, beautiful place. He started his design by mapping all the trees. Um, so it's a brand new neighborhood that has 150 year old live oaks. Um, really beautiful, beautiful place. You think he'd be interested in investing in Danby? <laughs> <laughs> I wish he, I think he's retired now, but he actually built this before new urbanism had a name. Um, and yep. wow. uh, the developers that eventually did um, Seaside and um, Celebration Florida came there and got tours and liked it. But really all he did is measure a beautiful old place and then build a new place like it. Wow. David, I see we're coming up on our deadline and I'm wondering whether before we go, we can talk about the meeting um, hours of Friday seven to nine is just does not work. <laughs> I don't know how others feel, but whether we could maybe do a doodle poll and find another time to meet. Yeah, um, do, you, do you wanna do it that way or do you wanna talk about a time now? I, I think most of them, people who come most often are here. I'd really like to hear from Debbie and, oh, your neighbor has gone already. Mm -hmm. um, and Olivia and, you know, the people who live in the Hamlet and own property in the Hamlet are really the most important constituency time-wise. Um, but if we, if we wanna look at a new time, I wanna find a time that we can continue on the same weeks every other week. Yeah, right. Um, I, I think any other day besides Friday would be good. What about hey, Thursdays? What about Thursday? Thursdays are horrible for us, but that's all right. By the way, I, I was on another Zoom call. I wanted to tell you, I spoke to six of our neighbors on Bald Hill, and every single one of them was really against any kind of Hamlet development back behind their houses in that uh, property or any of those properties. So that may explain why you don't have many Hamlet people here at the meeting um, in general up to this point tonight with the two Bald Hill neighbors now here. Um, and I don't think I spoke to both of those neighbors. So um, just just to let you know, okay? Yeah, this yeah. We, we, we know based on what happened with the, with the Hamlet revitalization plan, that there was not any great enthusiasm about putting houses behind. Debbie, are you still there? Uh, I'm here, yes. Are Thursdays a good day for you for future meetings like this? Uh, I suppose, I guess, so I'm wondering in terms of the time so you're meeting tw meeting twice a month and that's because of why I know there's some uh, moratorium coming up and I'm just trying to understand how that relates to this committee. Yeah, so um, the moratorium that was put in place in March limits subdivisions in the low density residential zone and um, we really want to have new zoning updated before that ends, which is at the end of the year. Um, so that's been, you know, a nine month process, but this, I think, zoning effort was well underway long before I was even hired. Um, I think Joel's been having the planning group for more than a year. Is that correct, Joel? Yeah, we got it up and running, I guess, February, February, March. Yeah. And the, the general sense that I've had from other town board members is that they kind of want the zoning reform thing to... Um, get done um, instead of dragging out forever. And it's really easy for things like this to go on for a very long time. Um, and so where I'm really coming from is that I want us to agree on something and get it adopted on that moratorium timeframe. Um, and to also understand that um, zoning is something that, that we build um, in the future. So we're gonna adopt something and probably the month after we may make some edits. Uh, I want the town to work on zoning being much 
more of something that we are constantly aware of and adjusting rather than something that we look at once and then don't look at again forever because um, we're not going to get everything right uh, in any one particular draft. Um, so, uh, so in terms of the process, this committee is going to make a recommendation to the town board, which would then vote whether to uh, uh, adopt it or not. Is that correct? That's correct. Basically. It's, it's yeah. the town board that makes the ultimate decision. And is there a, any conflict of interest that the members of this committee also sit on the town board or running for positions on the town board or are is advisor? And so then it's sort of whatever this committee decides, it seems like it's going to be um, just right through. Uh, no, I think I've worked on projects like this um, in other places where the town board wasn't involved until the end. And I think that that is really a waste of everyone's time. You really need them involved because they're the ones who are going to pass it. And if they don't like it, then we all just wasted our time working on it if they're not gonna, they're not willing to pass it. So I'm, I'm glad that they're deeply involved um, in the, the whole process so that when we can agree on something to, to forward onto the board, it's not them looking at it brand new, fresh. They've already been working on it through the process. I, I will say that there are different opinions within the board um, and within the committee. And so far, my experience with the committee has been, you know, it really is a committee where everyone has a voice. Um, everyone who comes is involved, which is the way that Joel set it up. Uh, and I think the committee has told Joel that they think differently than him a few times. And I think he's been a good sport about that. Um, so, I, and I'm sure that that will continue. So hang in there with us, Debbie. <laughs> um, Thursday would work for me. What do other others think? Uh, which Thursdays? Well, it would, it's, we're, we're meeting in the alternate week, so it would be the second and fourth Thursdays. It would just continue being I opposite the other. There, yeah. I think there will be some problems with Possibly the, well, you didn't say third, but third and fourth Thursdays. What's on the fourth Thursdays? Um, other organizations meeting. There, the Danby Community Council meets on a Thursday, but as suggested by you earlier, Ted, that could be moved. So, yeah, but, could be, yeah, but that's but the that's, first Thursday. That's the first right. Thursday. I'm thinking of other organizations. Danby organizations or not? Mm. Uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, if, you'll, if you'll pardon me, both the uh, county and Danby uh, Democratic committees tend to meet on the third or fourth Thursdays. Yeah, that's true. Mm. True right. that. We tend to have regular town meetings earlier in the week, although Wednesdays is what about Wednesday? Well, you have this one town meeting, you see. It's true, we have the the, the floating uh, second town board meeting, which is sometimes on the third and sometimes on the fourth Wednesday. Put it back on Monday. That's another story. Well, that's another story, indeed. Uh, maybe I will just uh, do a doodle poll because um, we're out of time. I'll send that yeah. around. It looks like we're going to do a post wanted, particularly yeah. since, uh, you know, people who are not here, uh, some of them are not here because this is, doesn't work for them and, and finding a time that does work for them um, would be good to have them be party to the process of selecting that time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. once COVID ends, Fridays are going to become really bad. Yeah, well, I hate Friday meetings, but that was the time that everyone <laughs> was available. It's the, only, it's the only one that worked. <laughs> with COVID, with nothing I else to do, Friday, Friday meetings are fine. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, people like Fridays. It's not fun. Yeah. Any night right. but Friday works for me. Not that anyone cares. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so just to <laughs> clarify, since I'm not a committee member, uh, if are. there is a change uh, that... Um, 
uh, it would be somehow publicized? Yeah, so here's what I need you to do, Debbie. On the homepage of the DMV website, I'm going to put it on screen right now. Um, so this is, this is the Town of Danby homepage. Uh, there's a form right here. You can leave a comment or sign up for email updates from the town planner using this form. If you click on that form and put in your email address, then you are on the committee and you will get every email about this committee and the other committee um, and the zoning update process. Um, and we can keep you in the loop about all of the updates. Great, thank you. Yep, and then the other place to look is on that, on that town website um, up here under calendars, all of the meetings are always there and you can see we're rotating conservation group, Hamlet group, conservation group, Hamlet group. So we'll, we'll move those Hamlet groups to whatever new, new time we decide. Um, and the other thing for you and your neighbors to know is that this, um, this, Not that one, that one, right? that one, yeah. Um, the town board monthly moratorium update meeting. Every month there's a meeting that's completely devoted to me giving the town board an update on where this process is. Um, and that's also a chance for community members to come and talk to the board um, and share their thoughts on the process. And that's where, you know, when we get a draft that we're ready to share with the board, uh, they'll have public hearings at that meeting um, you know, we're going to be hopefully releasing a draft um, in July is our goal that would um, be shared with all of the other committees in town, the planning board, the zoning board, the conservation advisory board, and also with the community. And that's a chance um, for everyone to come and provide feedback to the town board and the town board to decide how to move forward at that point. Um, again, that's you know, that's about halfway through the process where we're really um, honing in on direction we're going to go and what things need to change and that kind of stuff. So it's, there's still lots of time for community input. And with that said, I think we can stop um, this recording and close out this meeting. These meetings are all put on YouTube, so they're easy to share and watch later um, and watch double speed if um, you're bored or fast forward or skip people, all that stuff. So um, trying to make this as easy to get to as possible. Hope you all have a good weekend. Hey, David and Ted, well, if you have two seconds unrelated, Ted, because I know you're tech savvy, is there any way to take the Danby calendar